It's Friday night in October of 1993. And in Northern California, three junior high school girls are having a slumber party. Halloween is around the corner, and the girls have been trying on different costumes in preparation for the upcoming holiday. Within seconds, their lives will change forever. October 1st, Polly Class and Jillian Pelham were waiting for another friend outside of Polly's house in Petaluma, California. It was around 8.30 when Kate McLean and her mother showed up. The three girls were ready for fun. It was Friday night. There was ice cream in the fridge, and they were going to stay up all night long. This was going to be a party. No one had any idea of the danger that lurked so close by. The girls kept to Polly's bedroom, but they couldn't suppress the noise as easily. At about 9.45, Polly's mother, Eve Nickel, looked in on the girls and asked them to keep it down. She was suffering a migraine headache and thought she'd turn in early. Eve's bedroom was right across the hall from the girls, and although she had chided them about the noise, she was pretty sure it would only take a few minutes for the 12-year-olds to get noisy again. Before going to bed, Eve took her prescription pills to block out all distractions and get her fast to sleep. The party continued on for almost an hour before the nightmare began. It was around 10.30 when the intruder entered the room. At first, Kate and Jillian thought it was a joke. Then they saw the knife. He told them if they screamed, he'd slit their throats. Immediately, he tied them up and started asking questions. He wanted to know which girl lived there and who else was in the house. Polly spoke up. The girls were terrified and crying. And he assured them that he wasn't going to hurt anyone, that he was only there for money. But when Polly told him where some cash was hidden in a jewelry box, he made no attempt to find it. He gagged the girls and took the cases off some pillows to use as hoods. He made Polly get up and told the others to count to a thousand. By the time they were done, he said she'd be back. <laughs> then he took Polly class and disappeared into the night. Petaluma police officers were called to the scene after the girls managed to free themselves and wake Polly's mother. They responded in minutes. Investigators entered Polly's room and began to look around. The bedroom was in disarray and told of the events that had happened just minutes before. 
On the floor were binding materials, cut strips of cloth. The cords from the Nintendo game had been cut, and a strap that was clipped from a purse lay on the floor. Pillowcases were strewn about. I know. What Petaluma police detective Mike Meese saw wasn't encouraging. So I remember standing at the doorway to Polly's room and looking at these few bags of evidence that we had been able to collect and thinking that that was just such a pitiful amount. And I looked down at the rug and I talked to, to my partner, Larry Pelton, and said, let's take the rug. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know why, but let's just take the rug. We just don't have enough evidence. FBI. Police were in desperate need of assistance. Fortunately, help was on the way. After being contacted by the class family, the Federal Bureau of Investigation offered its expertise. How about, uh, have you all talked to the mother? Yes. Uh, Shortly after midnight, the FBI appeared at the house of Polly Class. Typically, the Bureau handles kidnappings, and with 800 a year to investigate, they have plenty of experience. Because he was familiar with the community and experienced in kidnapping cases, Special Agent Ed Fryer became the lead investigator. But he knew something about this case was different. It uh, had all the earmarks of a stranger abduction case because the statements from the two girls were consistent. Stranger abduction cases are the, are, are the hardest cases to solve, in my experience, because, again, there's no connection between the perpetrator of the crime and your victim or the victim's family, or somebody even associated to the, to the victim. It's a, a, a random act. Surprisingly, a vast majority of kidnappings involved disgruntled family members. And though Polly's parents were separated, her father, Mark Klass, was immediately cleared of any responsibility. Abductions involving total strangers are exceedingly rare and leave little for investigators to go on. In this case, however, there were witnesses. Was his hair long or short? A police sketch artist was called in from the San Rafael Police Department. For two hours, Jillian and Kate tried to recall the face of the man who had barged into the bedroom. The girls were still terribly upset, but they managed to give the artist a pretty good description. Authorities now had their first idea of what the stranger looked like. Nose and mouth. Uh, After 4 a.m., the girls were taken to the police station, and the FBI called in one of its special forces, the evidence response team. Tony Maxwell leads the crew. In looking at cases across the United States, we have found that when somebody is kidnapped, especially a young child, that they will generally be harmed within the first 24 hours, and probably within the first couple of days could even be killed. So time is of the essence. In that kind of work, the investigator needs to move quickly. The evidence response team is designed to provide forensic resources at a major crime scene. Their sole responsibility is to collect evidence. And they use the most sophisticated collecting equipment available to do it. An electrostatic dust print machine collects tiny hairs and fibers off the floor when a positive charge is passed over a sheet of mylar. Any loose debris clings to the mylar and is sent to a lab for careful inspection. Although the police department had already dusted for fingerprints, they had come up with nothing particularly promising but they didn't have access to the same equipment as the FBI. The alternate light source was a new method that employed a unique fluorescent powder, which when combined with a distinct ultraviolet light and amber-colored goggles, could illuminate many things that otherwise would remain hidden. The team found four dozen fingerprints the police were unable to see using conventional equipment. But even those were of no use. 
they were attributed to family and friends. After hours of meticulous searching, something finally turned up. A palm print that at the outset seemed like the first real piece of forensic evidence left behind at the scene. That palm print was found on the bed, on a crossbar of a, um, uh, of a bed, where he apparently put his hand up for just a second to lean on it, perhaps to support himself as he was grabbing something. And with the alternate light source and the fluorescent fingerprint work that we did, we were able to see it, collect it, and then gather that for the laboratory. At that time, the FBI's fingerprint database, APHIS, didn't contain palm prints, only fingerprints. But even a palm print won't catch a suspect. It will only identify one once he's captured. FBI Special Agent Mark Mershon explains. People often uh, think that when you have a fingerprint or a palm print that you quickly uh, you know, quickly uh, establish the identity of a criminal. The truth of the matter is, in, in most instances, you have to identify a suspect, have fingerprints for that suspect in order to compare with a latent fingerprint. The hunt for the suspect prompted authorities to cover Polly's neighborhood inch by inch. By dawn, more than 100 agents and officers had begun a 24-hour search for Polly and her abductor. Helicopters and bloodhounds had been called out, and an all-points bulletin was issued by local authorities and the FBI. Systematically, the authorities searched every house in the neighborhood. Agents went to Polly's school to talk with teachers and students in the hopes that somebody might have some useful information. Investigators canvassed the neighborhood in pairs, asking if anyone had seen anything suspicious that night. One by one, they interviewed all of Polly's neighbors. Several people recalled seeing a stranger around the neighborhood that fit the description given by the girls. Thomas Georges and his friends were on their way to the video store at around nine o'clock that night when he noticed a stranger standing in the shadows in front of Polly's house. Thomas knew everyone in his neighborhood, but he had never seen this man before. Returning home a few minutes later, the boys saw that the stranger was still there. The description Thomas gave to the authorities matched the suspect they were looking for. Sean Bush was playing video games with some friends who lived in a small rental cottage directly behind Polly's house. It was about 10.30 when Sean happened to glance out the window. He was surprised to see a strange man on the back porch of Polly's house. He appeared to be going for the back door. His description of the man also fit that of the suspect. There were others who saw the suspicious man that night, but unfortunately none of them alerted the authorities. As Petaluma Police Chief Patrick Parks explains, time was working against them. In stranger abduction cases of small children, there is no more critical factor than time. Time is absolutely of the essence. And for that reason, you have to get out as many resources as you can. You have to put out the word as far as white and wide as you can. You have to involve as many agencies you, as you can, get them focused, get their efforts channeled, and hopefully, hopefully, bring about a successful resolution. While officers continued to comb the neighborhood, FBI investigators began executing the standard operating procedure in cases like these. 
After eliminating family and friends as suspects, they focused on ex-cons who were registered as sexual offenders throughout Sonoma County. Gradually, they branched out to surrounding counties, carefully questioning and investigating each registrant. But nothing turned up. This is a hard case to believe that it even happened. There's three girls that are, that are in a slumber party. They're playing games in their bedroom, in their home, in a typical community, in a typical city. And somebody can walk into your home, the sanctity of the home, the security of your home, and take your daughter is, is uh, if it wasn't impossible, was inconceivable. The following day, the search for polyclass had escalated into the largest manhunt in the nation. A massive community volunteer network was formed to assist authorities. While hundreds of citizens searched, others passed out flyers, trying to cover the entire city as quickly as possible. Back at the FBI's Trace Evidence Lab in Washington, D.C., forensic expert Chris Allen was carefully surveying the items collected from Polly's house. I noticed that in untying the pieces of bindings, the, the uh, thin nylon strips of bindings that were used to tie up Polly's girlfriends, that they had jagged edges to them. And I was able to line them up perfectly so that I was able to determine that these all came from one piece of cloth originally, and it was a piece of cloth like a, a lady's nightgown or a, a slip material. Other pieces of evidence found in Polly's room were not so easy to classify. Tiny fibers collected with the electrostatic dust print machine proved to be a challenge to identify. After painstaking examination and comparison, Allen concluded that they had come from the interior carpet of an automobile. Eliminating the cars that could be accounted for at Polly's house, Allen suspected that these carpet fibers were most likely from the kidnapper's car. One more item Allen found was a little more personal to the suspect. I found in the vacuuming of the area rug that was in Polly's bedroom that she was playing on with her girlfriends, uh, a dark brown, forcibly removed head hair. And I say forcibly removed because it had a three or four millimeter uh, root sheath on it, actually skin material that comes out of the scalp when the hair is forcibly pulled or yanked out. If Polly had pulled a hair out of the suspect's head, it was evident that she didn't go without a struggle. But even a hair with DNA evidence couldn't bring investigators any closer to finding a suspect. The palm print lifted from the bedpost was sent to Michael J. Smith, a fingerprint specialist with the FBI. Examining the print under laser light, Smith determined that the print had enough ridge detail to photograph. But the light emitted from the laser turned the print orange, and Smith needed to capture a black print on a white background. He instructed the photographer to reverse the color so that the finished print would appear the way it would on a fingerprint card. Now the print was indelible and could be filed until a suspect was apprehended. Investigators had unearthed some solid evidence, but it wasn't enough. Time was running out, and Polly Class was still out there, somewhere. Forty-eight hours after the abduction of Polly Class, her father, Mark, Hello. got a call. Polly? It sounded like Polly. Okay, honey. She told her father that she was in a hotel room somewhere, you? and that her abductor had stepped out for a moment. Tell me where you are. Polly! Then the Polly. line went dead. It offered the first glimmer of hope. But unfortunately, since Mark's line wasn't set up for a trace, a fryer, all please. authorities could do was wait for another call. Word of the abduction spread rapidly. 
In two days, 50,000 flyers had been distributed. Community volunteers quickly organized a search command center to work in tandem with the police and FBI. It was an unprecedented grassroots effort. A telephone bank was manned 24 hours a day to field calls and tips. A copy of every lead that was phoned in was shared with the FBI and Petaluma police. Before long, the search center had screened 60,000 calls. Out of those, authorities were compelled to follow up on over 12,000 leads. Processing that amount of data would have been virtually impossible without help from an FBI computer processor. The FBI just happened to have the rapid start team. It was a relatively new concept with the FBI where on a high, uh, an investigation with a high volume of information, we would computerize that information, uh, essentially triage the, uh, the value of the investigative leads and make the assignments and track the, uh, uh, the progress. Even with so many leads, there was one in particular that investigators were anxious to follow up on. When Mark Klass received the first call, the FBI was powerless to do anything about it. The second time she called, they were ready. Hello. Like the previous call, it sounded like Polly, well, you, and she could only talk for a short time before she had to hang up. Where are you? But it was long enough for okay. authorities to make a trace. Polly. The FBI had traced the call to a house 30 miles away. There hadn't been enough time to collect an army of agents. The job would have to be handled by a few. Something wasn't right. This was just a normal family home. There was no sign of Polly or her abductor. A terrible realization dawned on the agents. When they sat down with one of the girls in the house, she confessed to making the calls. She admitted that friends from school had dared her to call and impersonate Polly. The entire incident had been a cruel joke. This was the, the only indication we had after a week's time that uh, Polly just might be uh, alive still, and we all were poised and hopeful that this would yield a solution and her safe recovery. Of course, it didn't. In mid-October, Kate and Jillian were brought in to give another description of the man who tied them up. A highly acclaimed forensic artist was flown in to make a second sketch. It was pretty well cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The artist was known for relaxing witnesses enough to coax an accurate description from them. The girls were less stressed than they had been that night and were able to give her more to work with. No, they were, they the were second different. sketch was much more precise. This sketch looked like a person. New flyers were distributed immediately. There was no time to waste. But if you look back at true stranger abductions, we have this rule of thirds. The children who are abducted, typically one third are recovered alive, one third are recovered dead, and one third are simply never heard from ever again. That's what we faced in this particular investigation. And that, uh, I think, was one of our uh, motivations uh, to keep the sustained effort up. After a reward had been offered for Polly's return, authorities received a call demanding a $10,000 ransom. 
they traced the call to a Petaluma apartment building. This time, a SWAT team showed up in force. They were not going to take any chances. FBI, FBI, down, 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 uh, it became very frustrating. It was certainly distracting towards the main thrust of the investigation, but you had to deal with it. There was no way around it. You could not ignore those things. And it, it certainly chewed up a lot of time and resource. The family had been especially discouraged. A letter Polly's parents wrote to the kidnapper was published in the October 17th San Francisco Examiner. Whoever you are, wherever you are, Please return Polly to her family. She belongs here. We miss Polly so much. We miss the twinkle in her eye and her sweet humor. We long to see her beautiful smile and hear her musical voice. They also addressed Polly. Our darling, if you can read this, please know that your mommy and daddy love you so much and we will continue to search for you until we can hold you safely in our loving arms again. I don't think I ever lost hope as I had Numerous contacts with Mark Class, with Eve, with members of the family. And that was a question posed to me many times. And my response was no. We have not lost hope. We will not lose hope. Across the country, people wanted to see Polly brought home. Banners sprang up and Americans began a candlelight vigil. Thousands donned ribbons of lavender, Polly's favorite color, to show their support of the search. We conducted searches uh, during the day, during the night. We had a 24-hour operation going. Uh, we conducted searches uh, sunny days, on foggy days, rainy days, uh, rainy nights. Whenever the information came in, we reacted to that uh, because in a case like this, physical evidence is crucial. The search never stopped. The Navy and search and rescue experts joined the thousands of volunteers who were constantly looking. Police and volunteer task forces worked tirelessly. But it would be nearly two months before anything broke. November 28, 1993. It was two months after Polly Class was kidnapped that authorities got their first real lead. In Sonoma County, a sheriff's deputy was called out to the house of Dana Jaffe. It sat at the end of a long, winding drive off Pythian Road. Dana had been out inspecting her property when she noticed something unusual and thought it might be of use to investigators. She led the deputy through a densely wooded area to a clearing just a few yards from the long winding drive to her house. Scattered in the woods were a few items that seemed somewhat suspicious. There was a large piece of silk cloth that had been fashioned into what appeared to be a hood. A couple of strips of packing tape were on the ground. A pair of young girls' tights had been tied into a knot, and human hair was entangled in the knot. Other debris surrounded the area. Then Dana recalled the night she'd caught a trespasser on her property not far from where they stood. It was nearly two months before. It all started when Dana's babysitter, Shannon Lynch, had left Dana's house and was making her way back down the long driveway. A man was walking down the middle of the private drive. His stranded pinto was off to the side. Get out of the car to help me. And now, sorry, 
He said that he was stuck and insisted that she get out of her car and help. He also wanted to know what was up the drive. But Shannon immediately sensed something wasn't right. She'd later describe him as looking like a wild man. She drove on, leaving him there, determined to get to a phone. Shannon found a payphone about two miles down the road and hurried to call her friend. She was anxious to get a hold of Dana and warn her of the scary man trespassing on her land. Dana didn't waste any time. She grabbed her daughter and a baseball bat and took off down the hill. She saw the car, like Shannon had said, but the strange man was nowhere in sight. She continued down into town and called the police. A few minutes after midnight, two Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies showed up. Dana explained that she didn't really want the intruder arrested for trespassing. She just wanted him off her property. The deputies found the trespasser a little agitated. There was alcohol on his breath, and he was sweating profusely. There were bits of leaves and brush in his hair, as if he'd been rolling around on the ground. He told them that he'd been out sightseeing when he realized that he was on private property. When he tried to turn around, he got his car stuck on the side of the drive. He blurted out that he'd been under the car trying to free it, but the deputies didn't believe it. The way his car was trapped, there wasn't enough room for a person to get underneath. The deputies administered some roadside sobriety tests, but he passed them all. Looking in his car, they found some cans of beer in a plastic bag and a small duffel bag in the back seat. When they asked him if he'd been drinking, he actually opened a beer and began to drink it. They immediately made him pour it out and then told him they wanted to pat him down. He became extremely upset. Leave me alone, just keep that stuff away from me, all right? To make him comply, the deputies told him they would be within their rights to run him in on trespassing. After he'd heard this, he calmed down considerably. They searched him carefully and continued questioning him, but could find nothing incriminating. He was just odd. The deputies remained suspicious, but when they ran his license, it checked out. His driving record was clean, and he had passed the sobriety tests. They had held him for about 45 minutes already, and they had no legal means to detain him any further. There was nothing left to do but pull his car out and send him on his way. That had been two months ago, the same night that Polly Class had been abducted. A hood, bindings, a young girl's pair of tights. It was too much of a coincidence. Putting it all together, the deputy quickly put a call in to the Petaluma Police Department. Within an hour, Detective Mike Meese and Agent Ed Fryer arrived to check it out. I'll never forget the scene. It was uh, late at night then. Uh, by this time, Mike Meese and I are, are standing up on the hillside there on Pythian on the road. It was beginning to get a little misty and foggy, and the rain started to come down. And uh, we looked at each other, and we knew, we knew in our hearts that we had basically uncovered a very critical crime scene, that this was going to lead us to the res resolution of this case. After the evidence was collected, investigators immediately began searching the Pythian Road site for any signs of Polly. We spent days searching the mountain with over 300 volunteers. I believe we had 25 to 30 search dogs, and uh, we conducted extensive ground uh, searches for Polly, uh, believing that she was still alive. 
which was the premise that we were working on. As the search commenced, everything began to snowball. Authorities checked with the Sonoma County Police to get the full report of the incident that happened on Dana Jaffe's property. The man deputies had questioned was Richard Allen Davis. Accessing his criminal record revealed he had recently been paroled from an eight-year sentence for kidnapping. What we learned about Davis initially was uh, 1976, he had been arrested for uh, robbery and kidnapping and uh, assault with intent to commit rape. We learned in uh, 1978 he had been arrested uh, for another kidnapping, as well as a couple of counts of assault with a deadly weapon. 1984 he'd been arrested for a kidnapping case, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, including the use of a firearm and armed robbery. You start reading these reports and realize, you know, hey, this guy's a bad actor. This is, a, this is an individual certainly more than capable of being involved in a crime like this. The arrest photo on file matched the girl's description. His mother lived in Petaluma, giving him reason to have been there. The pieces were falling into place. The items discovered near Pythian Road were immediately flown to forensic specialist Chris Allen in Washington. Of the most interest was a strip of cloth that was found in the woods. Allen was quickly able to confirm what detectives had suspected. Essentially what we're do trying to do is establish whether or not the cut edges would line up or match. The middle strips uh, represent the fabric that was found at Polly's bedroom, which were used to bind uh, Polly's girlfriends. <clears throat> Subsequently, on the second submission, we received the cloth that was found at the Pythian Road site. These all fit together like a puzzle uh, with the uh, edges and the, and the pieces of fabric matching up end to end. The strips meant more than likely Polly Class had been out at Dana Jaffe's after her abduction. Without a doubt, Richard Allen Davis had been there, too. Though it wasn't enough to arrest Davis for kidnapping, detectives felt if they could just get him in custody, they could quickly gather the evidence they needed to tie him to Polly's disappearance. Everything else fell away, and we focused on what we had with Mr. Davis, what happened out there at Pythian Road, and what we were going to do next. When investigators discovered Davis had an outstanding warrant for breaking parole and DUI, they decided to bring him in. But he wasn't at home when they arrived. Then a deputy sheriff who was securing a perimeter around the area stopped a van. At the wheel was Richard Allen Davis. When the deputy realized who he had, he calmly called it in to the investigators back at the house. Is there a problem, officer? No, sir. Just sit tight, okay? Authorities reported to the scene, and Detective Meese approached the van and asked Davis to step out. Step out of the van. He informed him that he was under arrest for violation of his parole. No. I'm Detective Meese. I'm arresting you. For One thing I think is important to understand how Richard Allen Turn Davis around. was taken into custody, because it was such a low key event, and because Mike Meese uh, went ahead and handcuffed him, he did it in a very professional way, and he started a rapport going with Richard Allen Davis that later was very useful uh, in bringing resolution to the case. It had been two months since Kate and Jillian had seen the man who took Polly class, but they had no trouble picking him out of a lineup. Number one, step forward, please. Even without the beard, his was a face they could never forget. Number one, step back, please. Though he'd been arrested for parole violation, Davis was questioned about the kidnapping. He vehemently denied any involvement. But authorities let Davis know that if he wanted to talk, the door was open. 
So I took Davis into the hallway and I told him, I said, hey, look, what you need to know is, is we've got all the physical evidence it takes to make this case. And all you're looking at is a kidnapping right now. So if you want to talk about it, you got to let me know. And uh, he made a noncommittal response, didn't want to talk. And uh, I remember patting my pockets looking for a business card, didn't have a business card with me. And I said, you know, I'm going to leave my name and number with those guys, meaning the correctional deputies. And if you ever want to talk about it, you know, give me a call. Back at the FBI latent fingerprint lab, Mike Smith was comparing the palm print found in Polly's bedroom with one that had been taken from Davis since his arrest. This was a crucial piece of evidence. Matching the two prints would undoubtedly link Davis to the abduction. After careful examination, the results were called in to Agent Fryer. I, I just got a call from FBI laboratory they matched Davis's palm print to a palm print taken off of Polly's bedroom uh, or her bed post. Um, it was again one of those moments where I, there was butterflies in my stomach. I again realized that this was really very powerful evidence. So I hung up the phone and again there was a lot of noise and commotion in the command post. I stood up and I asked everybody, can I have your attention please? Can I have quiet for a moment? I said, <clears throat> we just got confirmation from our laboratory that we've matched this palm print uh, taken from the bedroom to Davis. We can place him in the bedroom. And it was just a huge cheer from everybody. Papers were flying. Uh, it was just great news to everybody. This is it. It's concrete. He was in her bedroom. We can prove it. We had him nailed down. Though news of the matching print had gone public, Davis was being held in isolation and had not heard anything about it. Then one day, a friend of his showed up for a visit. He urged Davis to talk to authorities and tell them where Polly was. But Davis continued to deny responsibility. Then his friend gave him the news the rest of the nation had already heard. It came as a complete surprise. Davis realized it was going to be impossible to explain how his palm print got in Polly's bedroom. There was only one thing he could do. In Davis's mind, he's now got to do something, and that is try to make whatever deal he can make with the authorities because we, we know that, it, that he was in Polly's bedroom. We can put him there. While on his way to the massive search for Polly near Pythian Road, Detective Meese was paged to call the jail. This was the moment everyone had been waiting for, and Meese was anxious about what he might find out. Yeah. After this wait, you know, Davis comes on the phone, and I recognize the voice, and so I know it's him, and I said, uh, he says to me, he says, hey, I, I screwed up, I sc screwed up big time. Detective Meese and Special Agent Larry Taylor met with Davis in the interrogation room, where Davis related the details of the night of October 1st. Though he was living in something like a halfway house, he had applied for an overnight pass to go visit his mother in Petaluma. Unable to find her house, he had a few beards and walked the streets of Polly's neighborhood. At one point, he was stopped by a man who wanted to sell him some marijuana. He decided to go ahead and buy the joint. In Davis's own words, he got really buzzed and went to the store for more beer. He soon found himself wandering the neighborhood aimlessly. He wasn't sure where he was or what he was doing. But Davis had come to the neighborhood prepared he brought a bag packed with bindings and tape. Forensic experts were able to determine that he had cut the strips with a pair of scissors, a fact which implies intent. Then Davis said he randomly picked a house on the street and crawled into an open window. 
He remembered hearing TV voices and said he may have picked up a knife from the kitchen. He said he didn't remember anything after that. He claimed the next thing he knew he was driving in his car and was surprised to find a young girl sitting next to him. She was complaining that her hands were tingling. According to Davis, he adjusted the straps for her and drove around wondering what he had done and what he should do next. Then he drove off the side of the road and got the car stuck. Once he realized he was stuck for good, he says he got Polly out of the car and carried her up a steep embankment about 30 yards away. Get out of the car! He planned to leave her in the darkness until he could figure out a way to free the car. The rest of Davis's story about what happened at Pythian Road matched the witnesses' accounts. At the time of the incident, the bulletin about Polly's abduction was just going out over police radios. But the deputies were tuned to a different frequency and would not have heard it even if they had been in their cars. They ran his license, but the equipment they had at that time was only able to give a cursory printout of Davis' driving record. It couldn't generate his criminal record. They found nothing they could okay, hold sir. him on. What I want you to do is, all right, I'm going to follow my finger. And... Davis recalled how the deputies pulled his car out and escorted him to the main highway. You work with us? We yeah. run you but he claims that he waited for 15 or 30 minutes and returned to the site to find Polly. Then he just drove around. At some point, he realized he had to get rid of her. At long last, authorities had found out what they'd been desperate to know. Polly Klass was dead. And Richard Allen Davis was the man responsible. Davis agreed to take them to the site in a deserted area of Cloverdale where he had left the body. It was night, but inspectors felt the need to confirm Davis's story couldn't wait until daybreak. He led them to a field near an abandoned lumber mill. Out in the field, under some boards, investigators found the body of Polly Klass. It was, uh, it was an odd feeling. Uh, you're in the presence of somebody like Davis and just a few yards away is, is what's left of a very beautiful, innocent 12-year-old. The Polly class case was special because people cared. Because the whole community stepped forward and said, this is the last child you're going to take. And that this is our child and that we are going to go out and look for her until we find her. The case wouldn't come to trial until 1996. But after 10 weeks in the courtroom, a jury found Davis guilty on 10 counts, including kidnapping, robbery, burglary, murder, and attempting to commit a lewd act on a child. The latter charge Davis continued to deny during the entire trial. Investigators strongly believe that despite Davis's testimony, Polly was already dead at the time deputies helped him with his car. He was sentenced to death and continues to sit on death row at San Quentin Prison. Polly Class left behind a legacy to save other lives. The way missing persons cases are handled has changed forever since the investigation. Law enforcement databases are linked to different agencies providing vital information to multiple jurisdictions. 
Missing persons bulletins are now sent out over all police channels. At routine pullovers and traffic stops, officers can access not only driving histories, but criminal records as well. Implementation of the three strikes you're out legislation was a direct result of the case, as was the push to expedite the appeals process in murder cases. And a foundation established in Polly's name aids the search for missing children. Involvement of the FBI uh, was critical to bringing resolution to this case. Had they not come in and gotten involved early on, uh, it's doubtful we would ever have had resolution, or certainly that it would have been as, as quickly as it was, even though it seemed like a long time. The unique partnership that was formed between local police and the FBI set a precedent that continues to this day. New York City's Mafia an organization of brutal gangs. To gain wealth and power, members strong-arm businesses and kill anyone in their way. John Gotti was one of organized crime's fiercest members. He wanted to rule New York City. The FBI had to stop him. John Gotti was ambitious, powerful, and ruthless. He ruled with flash and conspicuous style, playing celebrity with the media and cat and mouse with the FBI. They called John Gotti the Teflon Don. Serious charges just wouldn't stick. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. When John Gotti came to power in 1985, organized crime still had its tentacles spread into many legitimate businesses. Like a game of chess, crime bosses were well insulated by layers of pawns. The FBI's job was to penetrate their defenses and capture the king. New York is the home of organized crime in America. Through intimidation, terror, and murder, the five families that make up New York's mafia have corrupted labor unions, run extortion rackets, and infiltrated almost every major industry in the city. Disputes among the crime families often erupt over who controls which union or what industry. These disputes are inevitably and violently resolved. By the 1970s, the Gambino family had emerged as the most violent and the most powerful crime family in the nation. As that decade came to an end, the FBI decided it was time to stop the Mafia's reign of terror. The Bureau's New York office set up five squads assigned to investigate and bring down each criminal family. Special Agent Bruce Mao was assigned to supervise the squad responsible for bringing down the Gambino family. The Bureau realized that we really weren't addressing organized crime here in New York, and so they formed uh, squads to target each particular crime family and try to address the organized crime problem here in New York. So in 1980, we formed the squad, and our target was to put the Gambino family in jail. The main targets of Mao's investigation were the leaders of the Gambino family. The boss, Paul Castellano, and his underboss, Neil Della Croce. Castellano assumed leadership of the family in 1976 when Carlos Gambino, the namesake of the family, died of natural causes. The FBI were also targeting the most powerful captains in the family, like John Gotti. The captains controlled crews of soldiers who carried out the day-to-day -day criminal activity for the family. Castellano's crews would commit the actual crimes, but Castellano himself did not. 
catching him seemed impossible. As the FBI soon learned, the entire hierarchy of the Gambino family was well insulated. The family army consisted of over 50 captains who controlled over 300 soldiers. It was a large and impenetrable secret society accessible to outsiders only through the lenses of surveillance cameras. But federal racketeering legislation was passed that made ordering criminal acts as much of a crime as committing the crime itself. In order to successfully prosecute the hierarchy of the Gambino family, the FBI had to secretly get them on tape discussing their criminal enterprise. Mao and his team would have to patiently and methodically work their way into the intricate structure of the Gambino family. It would take years to accomplish that goal. Agents tried to learn more by speaking to residents in the neighborhoods where mob activity was prevalent. Sure now. Yeah. But take a look. You might recognize one of these guys. Take a look. Take a good look. Take your time. Few people were willing to talk. Only those on the yeah. inside could tell agents who were the real power brokers in the family. Cooperating witnesses and informants had to be developed. Betraying the mafia meant certain death. Informants would be difficult to come by. but some were willing to take the risk. Most were low-level criminals cutting deals with the government to avoid prosecution and long prison sentences. Whatever their motivation, they gave agents something they did not have before, a back door into the Gambino family's criminal operations. Castellano ran the family like a major corporation. Nicknamed within the Mafia as the Pope, he used unions to strengthen his grip on various industries in New York. Louis Chilero, head of the FBI's New York office, is an expert on organized crime. One of the most influential things that the Gambino family did was the control of the labor unions in New York City. They exerted at one time tremendous influence in terms of the Longshoremen's Union, uh, in terms of construction industry, uh, trade unions, and in, and in terms of the Teamsters and trucking. Uh, by controlling the trade unions in New York City, the Gambino family was able to control construction and certainly had a great influence in the garment center. And that generated a tremendous uh, amount of financial base uh, to the family. You know, that's the paper trail. Castellano knew how to keep his interests under control. Castellano also realized how important it was to uh, ruled by fear and terror, so he had several enforcement arms of the family. He had a crew that was famous for uh, killing people, dismembering bodies, and doing all sorts of horrid things. So even though Castellano was known as the businessman's Don, he was a tough guy, he had a hair trigger and uh, temper, and he'd kill you at the drop of a hat. Getting to Castellano directly would be very difficult. His home in Staten Island was a fortress under constant supervision by armed guards. He had also installed a sophisticated alarm system. Agents had no solid evidence to suggest that Castellano conducted criminal business in his home. Without such proof, a court would never authorize an FBI bug or a phone wiretap inside the home. Agents hit the streets. They hoped to find one weak link to exploit one person in the family who made himself vulnerable to electronic surveillance. They learned through informants about a Gambino family crew headed by John Guy that operated in Queens, headquartered in a private social club called the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. A few of the FBI's well-placed informants were close to one of Gotti's lieutenants, a man named Angelo Ruggiero. Though known on the streets as the most vicious gang in the Gambino family, agents believed they found their weak link in Gotti's crew. And the reason we did was he had a lieutenant named Angelo Ruggiero who uh, ran the day-to-day -day operations for Gotti and his crew. 
And Angelo is an attractive target because number one, he's very active, uh, involved a lot of criminal activity. Number two, he had a big mouth. He talked a lot. He was a gossip and a blabbermouth. Mal quickly established surveillance teams to identify, record, and log every person who entered the Bergen Club. Agents learned that John Gotti and his crew made money for the family primarily through hijacking, car thefts, extortion, and illegal gambling operations. Informants told agents that Ruggiero sometimes discussed family business on his daughter's phone. He believed the line listed in her name to be free of FBI bugs. Permission to wiretap a private telephone is granted sparingly. Agents must convince a federal judge that the target is engaged in criminal activities and that the wiretap is likely to produce more evidence. If conversations are not of a criminal nature, the wiretap must be turned off. The informant's statements were enough to convince a federal judge in late 1981 that Ruggiero's daughter's phone should be tapped. Mao's squad had found a way to infiltrate the Gambino family. The wiretapping of Ruggiero's phone proved to be one of the most successful wiretaps in FBI history. Yeah. The conversations overheard by the FBI were damning. But agents learned that Ruggiero also held meetings in his home with Gambino members. Mao and his squad had enough evidence to justify placing a microphone in Ruggiero's home. Agents slipped in, installed the bugs in his dining room, and left without a trace. The success of the Mafia has always been its ability to stay one step ahead of law enforcement. What Mao and his squad did not know was that a high-ranking police officer was on the Gambino payroll Though the mole didn't know specific details, he leaked information to family members about ongoing investigations and electronic surveillance operations. Angelo Ruggiero became paranoid that his house was bugged. He searched the house himself, but found nothing. Unconvinced, he called in a professional to conduct a thorough search or sweep for bugs. Yeah, I need someone to come sweep my house, please. Ruggiero ordered the sweep on the tap telephone. When the FBI heard the conversation, they knew they had a crisis. 2345 Richmond Street. Got a problem. The phone first. tap inside the home was the immediately phone. turned off Wait to avoid to detection. All that work. All that work. If discovered, it would destroy weeks of diligent work and send the squad back to square one. And there were no targets as talkative as Ruggiero. Yeah, yeah, just come right here. Okay. The sweeper arrived with the most sophisticated electronic detection equipment available. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah. After two days of searching the house top to bottom, he was ready to report his findings to Ruggiero. Two days after Ruggiero's house was searched for bugs, agents arrested the man who conducted the sweep of his house. What they learned was indeed shocking. 
He charged Ruggiero thousands of dollars for his services, but none of his detection equipment worked. He had swindled the mob. Fortunately, he had told Ruggiero his house was clean. It was a lucky break for the FBI. Not only had their bugs not been discovered, but now Ruggiero felt confident to speak freely in his house. And he did so with abandon, right into the FBI microphones. Slowly, the FBI was getting closer to the Gambino family hierarchy. To agents, the conversations were a gold mine. As Ruggiero met with his mob partners, the FBI learned of a major heroin trafficking operation conducted by Ruggiero and John Gotti's younger brother, Eugene. Over a six-month period, Angelo and Eugene Gotti had distributed over 50 kilos of heroin in New York alone. The FBI had every last detail on tape. There was a mafia rule, in effect, that dealing drugs was strictly prohibited. The punishment for getting caught was execution. No appeal, no trial. Ruggiero did not have the boss's permission to deal drugs, and he knew the consequences. The government felt it had a strong case against Ruggiero and Eugene Gotti. In September of 1983, they were charged with running a major heroin distribution network and obstruction of justice. Though all of those indicted were part of John Gotti's crew, his name was not mentioned in the tape conversations. But with the indictment, Castellano would soon find out that Gotti's men were dealing drugs. Learning of the heroin operation, however, was not the only valuable piece of information learned by agents. Just prior to his heroin indictment, Ruggiero would meet with other soldiers and discuss how he and John Gotti would go to Paul Castellano's house every Sunday for a family meeting. And then Angel gave him a blow by blow what happened in Paul's house. The Pope did this, the Pope did that, he's mad at this guy. Everything's going in the family, we found out through Angelo's big mouth. And then next day, other soldiers would come over, of course, Angela, to reconstruct what happened again. So we found everything was happening in the Gambino family, thanks to Andrew Ruggiero, John Gotti, and Paul Castellano. Based on the Ruggiero wire, agents now had probable cause to bug the house of Gambino boss Paul Castellano. Getting into Castellano's house took detailed planning and methodical execution. Agents managed to get inside the house and place the bugs. Soon after, they began taping conversations that directly implicated Paul Castellano as the boss of the Gambino family, the man who oversaw a multitude of illegal rackets that cost taxpayers millions of dollars each year. Castellano would meet with his most trusted captains to discuss business. The FBI identified one of those captains as Sammy the Bull Gravano. As his nickname implied, the Bull was both strong and aggressive. He was a boxer and a bodybuilder. He was also the family's top enforcer. Gravano generated his money for the family in the construction industry. He was adept at a number of criminal activities, but his most notorious skill was murder. As the FBI continued to investigate powerful captains in the family like John Gotti and Sammy the Bull, their sights remained focused on the boss. In 1985, two years after Ruggiero was indicted, Paul Castellano was arrested and charged, along with other New York family bosses, with dozens of federal racketeering and conspiracy violations. Out on bail, Castellano continued to run the family, though his attention seemed focused on how to beat the government's case against him. 
John Gotti was also facing his own legal troubles. An independent investigation led by the U.S. Attorney's Office ended with Gotti and his mentor, underboss Neil Della Croce, being charged with several counts of racketeering. Della Croce and Gotti were released on bail, allowing them to continue their criminal operations. Months later, Della Croce lay dying of cancer. The FBI had bugged his bedroom. Gotti and Ruggiero visited and the FBI was listening. They recorded Gotti talking about his fears that Castellano might kill him and Ruggiero for getting caught on tape discussing their drug dealings and for leading the FBI to Castellano's house. The boss wanted to hear the FBI tapes. Della Croce promised Gotti that he would do anything in his power to protect him. Della Croce's loyalty to Gotti was causing a rift in the family. He was stalling the boss, reluctant to turn the tapes over to Castellano. The Gambino family was splitting in two. Then, in early December of 1985, Neil Della Croce, the Gambino family's second in command, died of cancer in his home. On December 16th, two weeks after Della Croce's death, Castellano and his new underboss, Tommy Bellano, pulled up to a fashionable steakhouse in midtown Manhattan to meet some associates for dinner. As they started to exit the car, several men approached them and began firing. Castellano and Bellotti never knew what hit them. They were killed instantly. When the boss of the family is assassinated, the FBI believes that the person responsible is usually the one who steps up and assumes leadership of the family. It was mafia tradition to pay tribute to a new boss, to show him respect. Two weeks after the murder, Agents watched a parade of high-level Gambino family members enter the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. They were meeting with John Gotti. Agent Mao and his squad would have to restructure their attack on the Gambino hierarchy. John Gotti was the new boss of the family. Agents pieced together his criminal history and traced his rise to power. John Gotti became a Gambino family associate around 1970. He impressed the boss in 1973 by killing a man who had kidnapped and murdered a relative of Carlos Gambino. Gotti served two years for the hit before he was paroled. Upon his release, he quickly gained respect within the family. He began to make a great deal of money for the family through loan sharking and gambling operations. In his neighborhood, he became a hero of sorts, throwing huge Fourth of July parties every year, complete with fireworks. Special Agent George Gabriel was assigned to Mao's squad in 1985. He quickly became an expert on John Gotti. He took care of it. If there were old ladies that were in need, if he had money in his pocket, he'd give it out. He was, in, in some respects, a Robin Hood in his neighborhood. And that's how he, he carried himself. But how did he make that money? By killing, by robbing, by manipulating, by bribing, by controlling rackets that he didn't have a right to control. And that's a side, when, when he didn't like you, when you fell on the wrong side of John, you died. I mean, there was no mercy. You died. There was no two ways about it. Gotti was now the king. He found himself in command of a multi-million dollar crime network made up of scams he did not know existed. He had a lot to learn. With their bugs and surveillance, Special Agent Gabriel and the rest of the FBI squad learned right along with him. John Gotti took over that family 
he had to learn what the rackets were, and as he's learning them, we're learning them. Who's got what industries? Who's collecting from what unions? He's asking captains to give him a list of all the soldiers in there and their crews so he could know who he's got in his family and how many. Gotti was the boss, but he still had legal troubles. Six months after becoming the head of the family, he was sent to jail to await trial on loan sharking and gambling charges. Jail didn't slow him down, though. From his cell, Gotti ordered a murder. It was against Robert DiBernardo, who had been a close associate of Gotti. DiBernardo's assassination was set up by Angelo Ruggiero, who was still awaiting trial for his 1983 drug indictment. Angelo's one of the few guys who's got access to John in jail and tells him that Robert DiBernardo is talking subversive behind John's back, the boss's back. He's saying that John isn't fit as the boss and we should appoint somebody else as the boss. Angelo wants this done because Angelo owes Robert DiBernardo a lot of money and he doesn't want to pay him back. Oh, I was going over some of these uh, contracts here, this public housing contract. On Gotti's behalf, Ruggiero asked Sammy the Bull Gravano to set up the hit. Did you want some coffee? Yeah, that'd be great. Give him some coffee, yeah. On June 5th, 1986, Di Bernardo showed up for a meeting at Gravano's construction office. Everyone greeted him as usual. Di Bernardo must have suspected nothing. You know, we got all those contracts. He was shot in the head from behind. His body was never found. The FBI learned of his death through informants. Agents believed Gotti's crew was responsible for the murder, but they needed proof. In August of 96, two months after the Di Bernardo hit, Gotti went to trial for the gambling and loan sharking charges filed two years before. But Gotti had not been the primary target of that indictment. The case was originally designed to bring down underboss Neil Della Croce. The case against Gotti was never that strong, but an ambitious U.S. attorney saw an opportunity to get a mob boss. Though the case did not involve Mao's squad, he sent George Gabriel to observe the trial. During a break in the proceedings, Gabriel came face to face with his adversary. I introduced myself, I told him I'm George Gabriel, I'm with the FBI, I work on Bruce Mouse Squad. He says, you tell him uh, I'm going to be home in six weeks, I'm going to beat this one. I said, right, I'll deliver your message. I said, and if you do, I'll be there to congratulate you because it'll be a good job on your part. He says, good, I, I hope to see you. On March 13th, 1987, Gotti was acquitted on all counts. George Gabriel made good on his promise. After the verdict, Gabriel went to the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club in Queens, where Gotti was having an acquittal party. He congratulated Gotti. To the press, the public, and to prosecutors, John Gotti seemed untouchable. Out of jail, John Gotti resumed his celebrity status. Around town, he was seen at fine restaurants and glitzy nightclubs, always immaculately dressed. Already, he was known as the Dapper Don. Now, with his acquittal, he earned the title of the Teflon Don. Charges slid right off him. To the media, he was glorified as the underdog who took on and beat the government. But now, it was Mao's turn to make a case against Gotti. I get upset when they glorify a guy like that. To me, he's just a, a common thug, a criminal. He's a terrorist. He doesn't believe in our government. He doesn't believe in voting, doesn't believe in church, he doesn't believe in family. He's a mass murderer. How can you glorify this guy here and make him a role model for your kids? It's very upsetting to me. In order to make his case against Gotti, Mao had to find out where he was conducting his business. The FBI bugs planted at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club had dried up. Since becoming boss, Gotti wasn't spending as much time there. 
The squad leaned hard on informants to find out where Gotti held his high-level meetings. It took eight months, but in early 1988, they finally found Gotti's new headquarters. Gotti turned the Ravenite Social Club in Little Italy into his headquarters. It was a symbolic gesture on Gotti's part. The Ravenite was his mentor, Neil Della Croce's old club. Here, Gotti would meet with his captains to conduct family business. Agents rented an apartment down the street from the Ravenite. A high-powered camera was installed to record all those who came and went from the club. In February of 1988, the FBI earned court approval to bug the Ravenite. With 30 or 40 people in the room, deciphering conversations was difficult. Cassette tape recordings of white noise were always being played in the club. Hearing conversations through that was impossible. But the FBI had to have John Gotti's orders on tape in order to charge him with running the Gambino family. So far, the bugs in the Ravenite had not produced much evidence. Gotti always suspected he was being listened to by the FBI, and he found clever ways to avoid being overheard. John Gotti was notorious for going on what we described as a walk talk, where he and the person he had to discuss something secretive. Not all mob business is open to everybody in the mob, there were times where a captain would have to speak with his boss, John Gotti would take that person, and they'd go outside. Going outside, they're evading the, the possibility of a bug. No matter what agents did, it seemed the mob was anticipating their every move, at times even taunting them. When I would sit in the van outside the Ravenite, they would bang on every van on the street and whisper, we know you're in there. You get made all the time, and you try your darndest not to, but it happens. And you just have to stay with it. John Gotti ordered another hit out of range of the FBI bugs. This time, it was Louis Melito, a Gambino soldier whose loyalty to Gotti was suspect. Gotti felt Melito was a threat to the family administration since Melito had been a close business associate of Paul Castellano and Tommy Bellotti. Sammy the Bull agreed to oversee the hit. He too had little use for Melito. Sammy felt he was trying to move in on the construction industry. Melito was shot dead under Gravano's supervision, his body removed and never found. The FBI learned of the hit through informant rumors. But again, there was not enough hard evidence on Gotti to arrest him. Gotti was ordering people killed right under the FBI's nose. The cat and mouse game intensified, and so did the pressure on the FBI to stop him from ordering more killings. Mao knew he was overlooking something. Gotti must be talking, but the FBI didn't know where. In December 1988, Bruce Mao decided it was time to shut down the wire and regroup. It was a very frustrating time because we knew we were so close. So we had these guys on videotape. We could see them coming and going. We saw the walk talks around the street. We were so close, but yet so far away from achieving our goals. The bugs were shut down, but the FBI's Gambino squad would not give up. They developed a new informant who told them Gotti would sometimes be in deep conversation with one of his men in the Ravenite. Then abruptly, they would leave the table and go into a hallway behind the club. Usually they were gone for 10 or 15 minutes. The meetings in the hall were no doubt incriminating ones. And in a quiet hallway, 
FBI bugs could pick up more of the conversations. The squad quickly took advantage of the opportunity. In October of 1989, agents bugged the hall. They recorded Gotti, meeting with several Gambino family members there. The bug produced some evidence against Gotti, but not the evidence they needed to put him away for life. Gotti had to be meeting his men in another location within the building. Somewhere where he felt comfortable and safe. In the fall of 1989, agents learned from informants about another location within the building that Gotti frequented. Nettie Sorelli was a widow. Her husband, Michael, had been caretaker of the Ravenite Club. When he died, she remained in the apartment they shared, just two floors above the club. It was believed that Gotti used Mrs. Sorelli's apartment to talk about sensitive family business. Getting into Mrs. Sorelli's apartment undetected was going to be a problem. She rarely left. As the FBI's Special Operations Squad tried to figure a way in, agents learned that Mrs. Sorelli would be leaving town for the Thanksgiving holiday. It was the opportunity they had been waiting for. Agents went to work. They sneaked into the apartment in the middle of the night and placed the bugs. On November 30th, 1989, the first conversation taped in Mrs. Sorelli's apartment came over the wires. Crisp and clear, all participants talked freely. They spoke directly, using no code words or sign language like they often did when a bug was suspected. For weeks, agents listened in on the apartment conversations. On December 12, 1989, they got the biggest break they could ever have hoped for. That day, Gotti and his underboss, Frank Locascio, met at the apartment. In a rambling conversation, Gotti left a trail of evidence that would later haunt him. He explained labor union rackets and other crimes. And he talked about ordering the murders of several people. The agents monitoring Gotti that night could barely believe their ears. More shocking to agents was what they heard Gotti say about Sammy Gravano. For over an hour, Gotti went on a verbal rampage about Sammy. He said Gravano was getting greedy, taking too big of a cut from the construction racket profits. He was becoming too active in the family not respecting Gotti's authority. Gotti suggested that two murders that he himself had ordered were because Sammy was trying to protect his own interests. According to Gotti, Sammy had suckered him into murdering Di Bernardo and Melito. It was a very important conversation because during this long diatribe, John confessed uh, to two murders. He confessed to ordering the hit on Robert Di Bernardo. He confessed to ordering the hit on Louis Melito. Both he claimed that Gravano's urging to have murdered. He also talked about a third guy named Louis de Bono who was going to murder another partner of Sammy's. Uh, John detailed also his control of different labor unions. He also detailed uh, how much money he's making from different illegal activities. It was our smoking gun is the best tape of the entire electronic surveillance. After recording a few more conversations, the wire in the apartment was turned off in May of 1990. For Mao's Gambino squad, all the years of patience had finally paid off. They had the best evidence they could imagine, and it was John Gotti himself. 
Over the next few months, agents put together their case against Gotti. The case against the Gambino family hierarchy, which began a decade earlier, was ready to come to a close. On December 12, 1990, exactly a year after Gotti's fateful conversation, Special Agent George Gabriel and two others went to the Ravenite Social Club. Their purpose was to arrest John Gotti, Sammy Gravano, and Frank Lucascio. Backup officers were close behind, or so Gabriel thought. When I went into the club uh, to arrest them, they, would, they had just ordered coffee. And uh, myself, my partner, and one of the police officers kind of accidentally went into the club ahead of the rest of the arrest team. We were about a minute ahead of everybody. So there we were in the classic, you know, we've got you surrounded, and we're looking behind us, and there was nobody there. But there wasn't a problem. Everybody complied with what we asked for. And either John or, or Sammy asked if they can have the cup of coffee. And I said, yeah, go ahead. We've got plenty of time before we leave. On his way to be booked, Gotti asked Agent Gabriel what he was charged with. Gabriel ran down the list and told Gotti of the taped conversations, especially in the hallway in the apartment. At that, Gotti fell quiet. At a bail hearing a few days later, the three defendants heard excerpts from the FBI's tapes. They played a segment from the December 12th conversation. Sammy Gravano heard Gotti bashing his character. For the first time in life, John Gotti was embarrassed. He was turning shades of blue and pink and trying to duck under the table. Sammy was turning red. You could tell he was hotter than a firecracker. And they kept looking at each other like, what's going on here? But that tape planted the seeds for the first time in Gravano's mind that he and God, John Gotti could never coexist. And one had to kill the other if they ever got out of jail. After hearing the tape, Gravano realized Gotti's defense strategy would be to blame him for the murders. Gravano was being set up as the fall guy. On November 8, 1991, Gravano decided to cooperate with the FBI and tell them everything he knew about the Gambino family. He filled in all of the details that were missing from the recordings about how he and Gotti committed crimes on behalf of the Gambino family and managed to stay one step ahead of law enforcement. Gravano arranged payoffs to jurors and a high-level police officer who had been supplying Gotti with classified information. Both the jurors and the corrupt officer were indicted and given jail sentences. Gabriel finally learned why Gotti had been able to avoid successful prosecutions. He's out there in everybody's face. I beat the government. They've got nothing on me. Reality was, he bought the jury. Uh, Sammy Gravano paid a juror $60,000 to throw that case. And that's, a, that, that's how he wins his case. The question most in need of an answer concerned the Castellano assassination. Through Gravano, the FBI finally learned the truth. The seeds for Castellano's assassination were planted when Angelo Ruggiero and Eugene Gotti were indicted in the heroin distribution ring in 1983. The prohibited operation could no longer be kept quiet from the boss. Castellano learned that the government's case was based on FBI recordings of Ruggiero. Castellano was furious. He wanted to hear the tapes for himself. Events began to snowball. In 1984, the tapes were finally turned over to the defense. And for the first time, all the co-defendants and defense attorneys had all these tapes of Angelo blabbing about heroin trafficking, meetings at Castellano's house, commission meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So around 1984, Castellano, being the boss of the family, asked Ruggiero for a copy of the tapes. The tension between Gotti and Castellano was held in check by Della Croce. But when Della Croce died, the barriers were down. A few days after Della Croce's death, Castellano summoned his captains for a meeting. Tommy Bellotti would replace Della Croce as underboss. More ominously, Castellano declared that Gotti's crew would be disbanded, his men absorbed into other crews. Castellano had finally listened to the Ruggiero tapes. 
they had given the government such a good case that after the trial, there probably wouldn't be much of a Gotti crew anyway. Gotti was furious, and he knew he was a target. There was grumbling among the ranks that Castellano was preoccupied with his legal problems and wasn't paying enough attention to the family. Some members thought he was pocketing too much money for himself, not spreading it around among the soldiers and captains. Gotti began to formulate his takeover. He had Angelo Ruggiero approach three of the four other Mafia families. He wanted to know if they would look the other way if something were to happen to Castellano. The family said they would not interfere. Gotti carefully picked a few soldiers to help plan the hit. In particular, there was one Gambino member whose support would be crucial if the hit was going to succeed. Ruggiero was sent to ask Sammy Gravano if he would participate in the murder of Castellano. Gravano agreed. He was aware of the growing dissent within the family. He also knew that John Gotti was powerful enough to pull off the murder of the boss. And when the other families agreed to stay out of the way, Sammy knew the smart play was to back Gotti. Gotti put together a team of five Gambino family members to plan Castellano's assassination. They called themselves the Fist of Five. Hitting the boss of the Mafia's largest family was a formidable task. The Fist would have to find Castellano away from his loyalists. And they knew that Castellano was under constant law enforcement scrutiny. He must be hit someplace where the FBI was not apt to be following him. Their best opportunity came in mid-December 1985. Castellano had asked five of his captains to meet him for dinner at Sparks Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan. But one of the captains was a member of the Fist. The night before the planned hit, the Fist convened at a construction office used by Gravano. Four shooters had been hired. Two for Castellano, and two for his driver and underboss, Tommy Bellotti. The murders had been meticulously planned. On December 16th, the team gathered in a park about a mile from Sparks. The four shooters dressed alike in black Russian hats and light-colored trench coats. If seen by witnesses, they were more likely to be remembered for what they wore rather than their faces. The primary shooters were to pair off just outside Sparks. Angelo Ruggiero was one of four backups who would block all avenues of escape. Gotti and Gravano would observe from down the street in their parked car, ready to shoot if necessary. If something went wrong, if they missed on the street, they were to move into Sparks, firing until Castellano and Bellotti were killed. No matter who got in the way, Castellano and Bellotti had to die. It was dusk when Gotti and Gravano headed towards Sparks Steakhouse. The shooters took their places. Gotti and Gravano soon found their vantage point a parking space at an intersection down the street from the restaurant. They waited in the car. Castellano was late. Perhaps he'd been tipped off about the plot on his life. In the middle of a conversation with Gotti, Gravano suddenly looked to his left and panicked at what he saw. It was a black Lincoln with Bellotti at the wheel and Castellano beside him. For one moment, Gravano and Gotti thought they would be seen. But the light changed and the car moved on. Angle 
Ivano radio to hit. It was time. As Bilotti pulled the car to the curb, the assassins advanced. Castellano and Tommy Bellotti lay outside the car, each shot by six bullets. According to Gravano, Gotti eased the car into the street and passed the body sprawled on the pavement. He had to be sure Castellano was dead. Gravano's detailed account finally put an end to the speculating. As part of his plea bargain, Gravano testified against his former boss. He admitted to his role in 19 mob-related murders. He served five years in prison and voluntarily entered the witness protection program. On April 2, 1992, John Gotti was convicted of five murders, including Paul Castellanos and Tommy Bellotti's. He also was found guilty of other crimes under the umbrella of obstruction of justice and racketeering. They included bribery of a police officer, jury tampering, gambling, bookmaking, tax evasion, and attempted murder. John Gotti lived out his life in federal custody, stripped of his audience, his expensive suits, and his flamboyant style. He died in a prison hospital on June 10th, 2002. The FBI crackdown on organized crime is working. Louis Shiliro, head of the New York office, is optimistic about New York's future. People today, I think, can, can build a building in New York City without being shaken down by a Cosa Nostra family. I think a restaurant in New York City could have their garbage picked up without fearing that they will be shaken down if they don't pick a particular carter. Uh, people today can compete on the Fulton Fish Market. Uh, without the necessity of paying off one of the particular New York crime families. So we've come a long way. Uh, there is certainly a lot of things that left to be done, but, but I think people generally in New York City, certainly, are starting to feel the effects of this effort. The battle rages on in New York City. Mafia families continue to plunder, continue to kill. But because of the ceaseless efforts of the FBI, the people of New York are beginning to feel relief as more and more mobsters like John Gotti are taken off the streets. A young man plans elaborate crimes he believes will net him millions of dollars. As he puts his violent schemes in motion, the lives of innocent people and police officers mean nothing. The FBI tries to bring him to justice, but they soon find themselves up against a criminal enterprise. a disguised bank robber hurled explosives at police and disappeared in a hail of bullets. When police identified the suspect, they connected him to an armed kidnapping, but they couldn't find him. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The suspect's behavior was organized, but unpredictable. Everyone leaves a trail, and agents hoped they could pick up the right one. Martinez, California is a suburban city 30 miles north of Oakland. 
As dawn broke on October 15, 1993, most of Martinez was still asleep. Nobody noticed the dark figure creeping across the rooftop of a downtown bank. He carried a top-of-the-line cordless power saw and drill with special motors that reduced noise. He seemed to know exactly where to cut into the roof. The masked man exploited a flaw in the bank's security system. The alarm was unable to detect movement in the crawl space between the roof and the bank's ceiling, allowing him to move freely. Just below was the bank's office. It was rigged with motion sensors. He knew if he descended below, he'd trip the bank's alarm. The masked man also knew bank employees would arrive in a few hours and deactivate the security system. He settled in and waited for them. Hours later, Martina's residents began their morning commutes. Two miles from the Martina's bank, in the city of Pleasant Hill, a police operator answered a seemingly unrelated emergency call. Someone saw two Hispanic males entering a supermarket with guns in their waistbands. It was just before 9 a.m. Pleasant Hill police officer Bob Lauderdale responded to the supermarket. M1, who's the reporting party? He's still on the line, a payphone at Well, my dispatcher advised that the uh, person making the call was calling from a public phone directly across the street from the store. He just hung up. He gave his name as Kyle Farrell. I noticed a black male adult standing in front of the phone booth. He was wearing a black varsity type jacket with uh, tan sleeves and carrying a full face motorcycle helmet. Officer Lauderdale and Sergeant Gary Ezell entered the supermarket to investigate. They would begin an aisle-by-aisle -aisle search for the suspects. Back in the city of Martinez, the masked man had waited three hours in the crawl space above the bank's ceiling. Bank employees were preparing to open to the public. They deactivated the alarm when they arrived. The masked man watched a teller punch in her access code to the ATM room, where she would fill the machines with cash. It was his cue for a dramatic entrance. The door automatically locked behind the teller. The robber threatened to kill her co-worker if she didn't open the door. Then, he opened it himself. The bank's manager was in the break room. She heard the commotion and glass breaking. She slipped out and called 911. 
Report of a 211 bank in progress. 6678 Alhambra Avenue. Dispatch Alabama. alerted Martinez police. The manager of the bank is advising that she heard someone in the other room shouting, get your hands up to retellers. All available units race to the bank with their sirens off. Robber left with a backpack stuffed full of cash. But to keep it, he'd have to evade Martinez police. Officers arrived at the front of the bank. Martinez and Pleasant Hill Police Departments had only nine officers available to respond. And two of them were tied up on a suspicious call at a supermarket. The robber saw an easy escape, the back of the bank, but he needed a diversion. Martinez traffic officer Earl Moffat moved to cover the rear of the bank. In his 10 years on the force, this would be the first time Officer Moffat would fire his weapon. He's firing rounds at me and he's only about 20 yards away. So it, it, what was going through my mind is just, just chaos. As the gun battle continued, Pleasant Hill police were still investigating the 911 call about two men with weapons entering the supermarket. None of the employees saw anything out of the ordinary. Officer Lauderdale was immediately suspicious. After we were unable to locate anybody matching that description, I thought the uh, bank robbery in Martinez was too big of a coincidence. In Martinez, the bank robbery suspect continued his firefight with Officer Moffat. I couldn't copy. His weapon empty, the officer was forced to reload. The gunman used the moment to his advantage. Moffat knew he would be vulnerable to ambush if he climbed over the fence. He followed procedure and called for backup. As officers cordoned off the neighborhood, Martinez police were joined in the investigation by the FBI and Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore. The FBI automatically investigates all bank robberies. Any crime against those institutions is a federal offense. We have concurrent jurisdiction and traditionally have worked bank robberies very closely with local police. When I first arrived, the scene was quite chaotic. We had been notified that a robbery had occurred and that a gunfight had in, uh, ensued after the robbery. Commander Tom Simonetti supervised the crime scene investigation for Martinez police. At the crime scene, we found shell casings from a Glock 45 pistol, as well as expended uh, rounds that had been fired at our officer. 
FBI agents know most bank robberies are poorly planned attempts to get drug money. The evidence this robber left behind suggested a more sophisticated criminal. The method of operation was so unique, you just don't see robberies committed every day by people dropping through the roof on, on a rope. On the rooftop, evidence technicians processed the abandoned power tools. They found no fingerprints. Agents interviewed bank employees about their traumatic experience. They described the robber as a muscular black male in a red jacket. The average bank robbery nets just $3,000. The bank manager determined that the robber escaped with over $35,000. And by getting it from the ATM room, no die packs were placed in with the money. Technicians found no fingerprints but discovered a shoe print on the desk where the robber landed. While the crime scene was being processed, Martinez police combed the neighborhood behind the bank for the masked suspect. They soon picked up his trail. It was marked by $20 bills that had fallen from his backpack. But the money trail abruptly ended at the closed end of a cul-de-sac leaving no sign of the suspect. Pleasant Hill police officer Lauderdale was guarding the crime scene when he recognized someone in the crowd of onlookers. And I suddenly noticed that the subject I had seen making the 911 call was now standing in a group of people who were watching the activities at the uh, bank robbery. I thought this was too much of a coincidence, uh, seeing the same subject down at the uh, shopping center and was now at the uh, bank robbery in Martinez. I contacted the subject in order to uh, identify him and find out what he was doing in the area. What are you doing here today? The officer knew the 911 caller at the supermarket gave dispatchers the name of Kyle Farrell. Now the man said his name was Ural Wills. It was suspicious enough for Officer Lauderdale to request the man to go to the police station for questioning. The subject was uh, surprisingly cooperative and uh, had no problem with uh, going to talk to uh, Martinez detectives. The man furnished Martinez police with a driver's license that seemed to confirm his name was Ural Wills. A check of his record revealed that three years earlier, in 1990, he was arrested for an armed robbery of a supermarket in Oakland, but was later acquitted. Despite the prior arrest, police had nothing linking the man to the Martinez bank robbery. They had no choice but to release him. They didn't know that uncovering the man's true identity would lead them to the bank robber who was willing to kill to escape police. In Martinez, California, a bank robber threatened employees' lives until he got what he came for. $35,000 in cash intended for the bank's ATM machines. Police searched for the suspect by following a trail of $20 bills near the crime scene until it ended in a residential cul-de-sac. For FBI Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore, the end of the trail was itself a clue. Right, well, we don't have that yet. We're still waiting. The trail of $20 bills stopped there. so. Initially, we, we assumed that there had been a getaway car somewhere near that end of that cul-de-sac. Martinez police interviewed residents who lived in the ordinarily quiet suburban area. One homeowner said that earlier in the day, he was working in his front yard. He noticed a brand new Jeep Cherokee speed past his home. He thought the white female behind the wheel might have been just a reckless teenager 
The witness said the vehicle had no license plates, only a placard from a nearby Jeep dealership. Several other witnesses in the neighborhood also saw the vehicle, but none of them could agree on the Jeep's color. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you. I may call on you again. Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore pursued the vehicle lead. Yes, Bob Moore with the FBI. He called the dealership advertised on the SUV and learned they sold over 60 new Jeep Cherokees in the past three months. We began identifying the people who had purchased those cars with uh, negative results. Each Jeep Cherokee had to be investigated. Martinez Police Commander Tom Simonetti knew it would be painstaking work. We also talked to several of the registered owners of new Jeeps, and they had either no criminal record or they had been out of town and were able to prove that they weren't involved in the robbery. We found that one had been stolen from a nearby BART station. The vehicle was recovered in the city of Concord, and after investigating it and processing it, it was determined that it was not involved in the uh, crime. The last two Jeeps that we looked at were both sold to a rental car company in the city of Antioch. This is what we have here. Anything else Agents the went to the rental company to investigate the last two vehicles. You can get me the rental paper. They requested copies of the rental contracts. They learned one of the Jeeps was rented the day before the robbery and returned the following evening. The name on the contract was one Ural Wills, the name used by the motorcyclist in the Martinez Bank parking lot, who was also the same man police observed making a 911 call near a Pleasant Hill supermarket. Martinez police needed to clear up the question of how Ural Wills could have simultaneously fled from the area in a Jeep and been spotted in the bank's parking lot as an onlooker. For answers, they turned to Officer Lauderdale. Take a quick look at these. When I presented the picture of Ural Wills and in the photo lineup to Officer Lauderdale, he identified a different person as Ural Wills. Lauderdale picked the photo of Doug Jones, a known criminal associate of Ural Wills. In looking into Mr. Wills's criminal history, we determined that he had an accomplice who had committed several crimes with him. Detectives believed that the accomplice, Doug Jones, posed as Wills at the scene of the robbery to throw off police. They now considered Wills their prime suspect. To agents, it was clear why Jones made the call while the bank robbery was in progress. Yeah, that's who I contacted. The planning of this included the attempt to create a diversion of the police by making a 911 call to the Pleasant Hill Police Department. Martinez police ran a more detailed background check on Ural Wills. They spoke to the Oakland detectives that arrested him three years ago for a supermarket robbery. They expressed their frustration that he was later acquitted. Martinez commander Tom Simonetti learned of yet another recent arrest of Ural Wills. During this investigation, we had found that Mr. Wills had been arrested by the California Highway Patrol for carrying a loaded Glock pistol. Martinez police discovered that the bank robber also used a Glock pistol. Ballistics tests on the recovered bullets revealed that they were from a Glock 9mm. Martinez investigators also learned from Oakland criminal informants that Wills often preyed on other criminals. He had made several armed robberies of known drug dealers in the city of Oakland. 
which led us to believe we were dealing with somebody who either wasn't afraid or was very brazen in his criminal activity. The same criminal informants gave police insight to Ural Will's methods of operation. They said he often used female getaway drivers because Wills believed they were less suspicious to police. The fact that a woman was seen behind the wheel of the Jeep was consistent with Will's criminal history. From the auto rental contracts, agents were able to trace Ural Will's financial records. The Jeep Cherokee had been paid for with a credit card by Wills. We determined through uh, subpoenas that the credit card had been issued by a credit union in Berkeley. They also learned Wills had a savings account at the credit union, but found no unusually large deposits that could be linked to the Martinez bank robbery. We asked the employees at the credit union if he were to appear at the credit union to call the Berkeley Police Department. Thank you very much. Even without any suspicious bank deposits, agents and Martinez Police Commander Tom Simonetti still believed evidence implicated Wills in the bank robbery. Wills had an apartment in Antioch, California, 20 miles east of Martinez. Based on the information compiled by the Martinez Police Department, the FBI, and the Antioch Police Department, we were able to obtain a federal search warrant of Mr. Will's apartment in the city of Antioch. 30 days after the bank robbery, FBI agents and a police SWAT team prepared to execute the search warrant on Will's apartment. They knew he had already fired 10 rounds at a Martinez police officer. The SWAT team suspected Wills would shoot again. FBI agents and the Martinez police SWAT team were serving a search warrant on an apartment belonging to bank robbery suspect Ural Wills. They found one man in the apartment. The SWAT team quickly determined he was not Wills. They identified him as Doug Jones, who was a known criminal accomplice of Ural Wills, as well as Wills' roommate. Jones was the man seen making the 911 call near a supermarket before the Martinez bank robbery, and the man spotted in the bank parking lot after the robbery. Officers removed Jones from the apartment and took him to the station for questioning. As investigators executed their search warrant, they found several items of interest, including a bulletproof vest. Agents also found a red jacket that matched witness descriptions of the bank robber's clothing. In the bedroom, they identified a pair of sneakers as the type worn by the robber. They found an even more telling clue inside one of the shoes. $3,000, all in $20 bills. The stolen money from the Martinez bank was also entirely in $20 bills. The shoes were sent to the lab where the soles could be compared to a shoe print recovered from the Martinez bank robbery. Detectives also uncovered hospital bills that suggested Wills was injured on the day of the bank robbery. Martinez Police Commander Tom Simonetti followed up. Upon contacting the doctor at the hospital, he told us that Mr. Wills had told him that he slipped on a wet floor at a grocery store and broke his foot. The doctor, however, pointed out that the injury was more consistent with a hard impact, in particular a straight down impact from falling or dropping off something. Wills was further tied to the crime when analysts confirmed one of the shoes found in his apartment matched the shoe print taken at the scene of the Martinez robbery. At the police station, Where is Mr. Wills? agents questioned Wills' roommate and criminal associate, Doug Jones. 
As suspicious as Jones' actions were, police couldn't charge him with a crime or make him talk. If Jones knew where Wills was hiding, he wasn't telling investigators. The biggest frustration in this case was trying to locate Mr. Wills after he knew we were looking for him. 222, go ahead. We had searched his residence, we had contacted everybody that knew him, and there was no doubt he knew we were after him. Agents knew Wills was a career criminal and were certain he would strike again. They spent nearly a month searching Bay Area neighborhoods Wills was known to frequent. They found no sign of the violent fugitive. While investigators hunted for Wills, he was planning a crime even more ambitious than his Martinez bank robbery. He gathered a group of accomplices and filled them in on his plan. Four days before Christmas in 1993, Will's accomplices descended upon the Antioch, California home of jewelry store owner Gene Mayer and his wife, Ruth. They posed as detectives investigating credit card fraud. Once the door was opened, they revealed their sinister purpose. Two bound the couple with duct tape, while a third moved toward the back of the house to look for a safe. You guys stay quiet. Don't move. You won't get hurt. You got the safe? Good. Let's go. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. The men told Gene Mayer they were kidnapping his wife. They said they'd phone with the details on how he could retrieve her. Mayer could do nothing, as Ural Will's accomplices left with his wife and a safe full of jewelry. They used Mrs. Mayer's Suburban as their getaway vehicle. Get in there. Just 10 minutes later, Gene Mayer freed himself and called 911. Antioch police responded. The scene was supervised by Sergeant Scott Williford. When I arrived at the Mayer residence, officers were in the process of cordoning off the crime scene with police tape and barriers. I went inside the residence and Gene Mayer was in the process of uh, being interviewed. He was uh, very traumatized. Detectives tried to focus Mr. Mayer on describing his wife's abductors, but he got only brief glances at them. As detectives processed the house for evidence, they discovered a ransom note. Mayer never saw the kidnappers leave it. The note warned him not to contact the authorities. Gene Mayer worried that he might have made a mistake by calling police. He feared the kidnappers would retaliate by killing his wife. To help find Mrs. Mayer, Antioch police requested assistance from the FBI. They searched for any sign of Ruth Mayer's Suburban that her abductors used as a getaway vehicle. Investigators knew the chances of finding a kidnapping victim alive diminish the longer the victim is held captive. Officers in Antioch and neighboring communities 
urgently scoured parking lots at shopping centers, thinking the kidnappers might have abandoned Mrs. Mayer's SUV and switched to another vehicle. They found nothing. Still on the airport road. You've got to do it. Get after it. Detectives learned that the jewelry in the stolen safe was worth $400,000. But Mr. Mayer wasn't concerned about the jewelry. He wanted his wife returned unharmed. Blindfolded during her abduction, Ruth Mayer had no idea where she was or what the kidnappers had in store for her. Bank robbery suspect Ural Wills used a team of accomplices to rob a jewelry store owner and kidnap his wife. Inside the mayor home, Antioch police analyzed the ransom note left behind by the suspects. The kidnappers demanded $2 million for the safe return of Mrs. Mayer. Police anticipated they would phone with instructions. Technicians installed phone traps to trace and record any incoming calls. But none came. For more leads, Antioch Police Sergeant Scott Williford gathered details about the jewelry stolen from the house. If any of it turned up, it might put them on the trail of the kidnappers. Since Mr. Mayor was a jeweler, he had specific in detailed information on the description of all the jewelry. We were able to provide or compile a detailed list and put it out to other agencies regarding the stolen property. The FBI brought additional resources and helped coordinate the search for any sign of Mrs. Mayer or the suburban her abductors stole from her driveway. By the following morning, investigators were still combing the mayor's neighborhood for clues. Teams of officers and agents began talking to people in the neighborhood. We were, were knocking on doors asking if people had seen anything suspicious in the area. In addition to interviewing neighbors, investigators like Antioch Police Sergeant Scott Williford turned to the media for help. We did everything possibly that we could to get the information out to the public so we could have the public's assistance in trying to locate Ruth Mayer. Hundreds of volunteers distributed over 8,000 leaflets throughout the Bay Area. The leaflets had photos of Mrs. Mayer and a description of her suburban. The strategy quickly brought results. Within hours after the kidnapping, with the information put out to the other agencies, we located the suburban that was stolen. Technicians processed the vehicle for evidence. They found nothing useful. Investigators theorized that the kidnappers transferred Ruth Mayer to a second getaway vehicle. They took impressions of fresh tire tracks found at the scene. The impressions could be compared to the suspect's vehicle if it was found. Although they had found her vehicle, detectives still had no clue where Mrs. Mayer was being held. The kidnappers left her unattended for hours at a time. She used the opportunity to bite through her restraints. Mayer knew an escape attempt was too risky. Instead, she memorized the details of the garage in case she was ever asked to identify it. In the driveway, she saw the outline of a car. It was covered with a blue tarp. Mayer thought about shouting for help, but she was concerned what might happen if her abductors heard her. For the time being, she had no choice but to wait. Uh, mm. 
Mr. Mayor quickly raised the money he hoped would bring his wife home. Wearing latex gloves, agents recorded the bill's serial numbers. They were prepared to make the drop as soon as they received instructions from the kidnappers. Two days after the kidnapping, police responded to a call from a Berkeley credit union. The FBI had asked the manager to call police if he saw the suspect from the Martinez bank robbery. He spotted Ural Wills trying to make a deposit. Like a phone here? Bring up your account number. The teller tried to access the account, but it was frozen. Berkeley police arrived and calmly approached the bank, but Wills spotted them. As they frisked Wills, Berkeley police retrieved a loaded clip for a 9mm Glock pistol. They also found Wills had something else to hide. Located in his pocket was a key to a car. The police officers asked him where his car was parked. He denied owning a car. The officers then walked down the street checking vehicles until they located his vehicle. The keys in Wills' pocket fit a Ford Explorer. FBI Supervisory Special Agent Bob Moore searched the impounded vehicle for evidence that would link Wills to the Martinez bank robbery. Instead, he uncovered the first break in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping case. The key items of evidence found in the Ford Explorer the day of Wills' arrest were a cell phone, a weapon, a pager that belonged to Ural Wills, and a bag containing jewelry. Agents had previously thought the Ruth Mayer kidnapping and Martinez bank robbery cases were unrelated. All that changed when they discovered some of the jewelry was personalized. RM were the initials of Ruth Mayer. Agents showed the jewelry to Ruth Mayer's husband, who confirmed it was stolen from their home. Investigators now considered Wills a suspect both in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping and the Martinez bank robbery. To further tie Wills to the Martinez bank robbery, FBI technicians performed ballistics tests on the Glock handgun recovered from Wills' vehicle. They compared the bullets test fired by the Glock in the lab to bullets recovered from the Martinez bank crime scene. The tests indicated the bullets were not fired by the same gun. Investigators believed Wills probably disposed of the pistol used during the bank robbery and replaced it with another gun of the same make and model. All right, we found the jewels in your car. Right, I want to know where you were and what you were doing. Now. Wills was no longer just a bank well, robbery suspect. He was also a suspect in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping. We can already connect you to Mrs. Mayer. What these jewels are doing. Desperate to save Mrs. Mayer's life, Antioch police asked Wills to tell them where she was being held. But Wills refused to cooperate. He remained silent on his involvement in the Ruth Mayer kidnapping. With Wills in jail, investigators were concerned his accomplices would panic and do something desperate. This kidnapping certainly exhibits some organization to it. And, but Authorities the held a press conference to appeal for new leads. They also warned Will's accomplices that they were closing in 
and that Mrs. Mayer should be released unharmed. On the other hand, I can't say for certain, but certainly we're looking at that. I've been here this whole time. Nobody's telling me nothing. On the fourth day of Mrs. Mayer's captivity, Christmas Eve, the man guarding Mrs. Mayer received instructions from the other accomplices in the kidnapping plot. His orders were to get rid of Mrs. Mayer any way he could. The man ordered her to stay down and out of sight while he drove. Mrs. Mayer couldn't be sure whether she was going to live or die. Kidnapping victim Ruth Mayer had endured four days of captivity. The ringleader of the abduction, Ural Wills, was in police custody on bank robbery charges. That left Wills' accomplices leaderless, and they were worried that the law was closing in. The accomplices ordered the man guarding Ruth Mayer to get rid of her any way he could. Thirty miles north of her Antioch, California home, where she was abducted, in a town called El Sobrante, the kidnappers decided to get rid of Mrs. Mayer by releasing her. Now, don't take off your blindfold. Antioch Police Sergeant Scott Williford believed police efforts to reach the kidnappers through the media paid off. Well, they knew the seriousness of the crime. They knew the pressure was on. This was a national publicized case at the time, and they didn't know what to do. It was so high profile. Everybody knew all the details of this, and they were forced to release her. News of Ruth Mayer's return made headlines and the local newscasts. I just want to say that I'm so, so very happy to be home. Anything that you can do. Investigators questioned Mrs. Mayer about her ordeal. She didn't know the location in which he was held and could not describe her abductors. Even so, she provided agents with important detail. She was able to use her senses as she was held in this garage and actually had remarkable recall as to a lot of the, the circumstances that were occurring in the area where she was held. She described certain sounds that she heard while she was held. She described the sound of trains going by. She described the sounds of buses or diesel-powered vehicles having to gear down or slow down as if to take a sharp turn. Now, we've gotten a fair amount. Based on information obtained from Mrs. Mayer, investigators were looking for a location near train tracks and major bus lines. They used the cell phone seized in Will's vehicle to narrow the search. Agents quickly obtained the phone's billing records and they just make their way heading east. They concentrated on calls Wills made around the time of Mrs. Mayer's kidnapping. We were able to track the cell phone usage and determine where it had been in use the prior night, including in Antioch and as well as the numbers uh, that, that it had called that night. Investigators learned towers in West Contra Costa County picked up Will's cell phone signal on the evening of the kidnapping. They began looking for streets in Contra Costa County where train tracks and major bus lines intersected. Based on Mrs. Mayer's observations, agents were looking for any home that had a vehicle covered with a blue tarp in the driveway. We located the house in San Pablo, and just from the visual inspection outside, it matched the criteria and the description that Ruth Mayer gave us. Agents obtained a search warrant for the home and found no one inside. This is the Mrs. Mayer identified the garage as the place in which she was held. Agents wanted to question the home's owner, but they were unable to locate him.
investigators sought out homeowner's relatives in an effort to find him. Edward Rodriguez was the homeowner's nephew. Agents were unaware that he guarded Ruth Mayer during the kidnapping. But Rodriguez mistakenly believed the agents were looking for him and said he was just about to turn himself in. Investigators found Rodriguez remorseful about the part he played in the kidnapping and convinced him to cooperate. Ultimately, the guard confessed to the whole crime, confessed to the planning, the details of the operation, and laid out the, um, the whole crime from A to Z. Rodriguez named all the conspirators in the scheme. Anybody else here? He said Ural Wills planned and led the kidnapping operation. Agents corroborated the guard's statements with Wills' cell phone records. They later apprehended all the conspirators. Brian Tomasello, one of the gunmen that burst into the mayor's home, was found guilty on six counts of robbery and kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison. Edward Rodriguez was found guilty of kidnapping and robbery. The jury gave him a short eight-year sentence because he released Mrs. Mayer. Before he could be tried for the Ruth Mayer kidnapping, Ural Wills was found guilty of the Martinez bank robbery and was sentenced to 39 years. Prosecutors learned that Wills was suffering from kidney failure. Doctors gave him less than 10 years to live. Wills was certain to die in prison. He's having serious kidney. Prosecutors informed Mrs. Mayer of their plans not to try him for her kidnapping. She's a forgiving person. She knew justice was served. She knew he was in custody, Mr. Wills, for the rest of his life. And I believe that she forgave everybody. As he pursued his violent schemes, Ural Wills had expected to make millions and live a life of luxury. Instead, the FBI and local police made sure the criminal's last days were spent behind bars.